Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Emily, and I'm the senior ambassador for today. Today, we're here with Ms. Clayton. So, Ms. Clayton, do you mind um, sharing a little bit about your job and maybe a little bit about yourself? Just a small introduction. Absolutely. I am so happy to be with you today. My name is Robin Clayton, and I'm the director of talent acquisition at City of Hope. And we're, our main campus is physically located in Duarte, California. I can go into a little bit more about myself if you want to at this time. Yeah. Okay. So I have been in the human resources space for over 25 years. And, you know, people say, how did you get into HR? And back when I started, you pe people just fell into it. Now it's more of a um, decision for people. There's people looking to the majors, they look into professional growth, they actually set out and say, oh, I want to go into HR. But I was very, very fortunate to actually fall into it. And I had started this job and it was a home infusion company. And I had this most terrific um, boss and he said, hey, I want to I want to expose you to something. And so he said, I want you to sit in on these interviews of our nurses and our pharmacists. And I said, oh my gosh, I've never done anything like that. And that started it for me. I got the bug for HR and that started my career path. So I got to be over all of the recruitment for this organization, which led me to each position that I've had from there on. So um, I did most of my career for almost 18 years at UCLA Health. And that is why King Drew is so near and dear to me because we have hosted your students for many, many years. Um, what you have brought to the table just always amazed me. And I enjoyed the, the interaction that I got to have with all the students there. In fact, I still stay in contact with some of your graduates. And you know that one just got her PhD because she's on my Facebook and she just got her PhD and she's an alumni. I think that is incredible. And I, the other one that stands out to me, and there's many of them, the other one that stands out to me is he has moved up the ladder within our IT, with, I should say R because I don't work at UCLA anymore, but at the UCLA IT department. And he's now one of the senior leaders there. And this is incredible. Those are two stories of many, many. So for, as I said, I was there almost 18 years um, as the manager of recruitment and then City of Hope reached out to me a couple of times and I, and I did politely decline. And then finally I, they said, why don't you come on campus? And I went on campus and I don't know if anybody on the call here has been to our beautiful campus, but I went there and there's this fountain, it's called Spirit of Life Fountain. And I'm waiting there to get taken into my interviews. And so I'm watching the employees that don't know anybody's watching them. And I see how they are with our patients and each other and the compassion, the genuine, authentic compassion that they had. I kind of got chills and I said, oh my gosh, maybe I am supposed to be here. Maybe this is where I'm leading, my, my career is leading me to. Never thought I would be leaving UCLA Health, which is a wonderful organization. Anyway, Long story short, here I am five years later, um, probably one of the best professional and personal decisions I have done. Um, that compassion did not fail me. I see it every day, not just with our patients, but with, our, with each other. And that's so important. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I do now. And I wanted to also tell you a little bit about City of Hope. So now I am the director of talent acquisition. And... Um, Prior to October, I was leading all of the recruiters. So these are the recruiters that are finding these talented clinical and non-clinical people to take care of our patients directly or indirectly. So finding um, diverse talent in areas that maybe people don't even know about City of Hope. So I was doing that for um, many years. And then in October, you guys, I got my dream job. So it's never too late, you will have your dream job. So I always had about a few toes in this, what I'm gonna tell you in a minute, at UCLA. And then I had a few toes in it at City of Hope. And then they were thinking, my leadership came to me and said, we need you to do this full time. So now I get to lead all of the community engagement and outreach. I get to speak to students like you. I do high, I speak to high school, college, um, professional groups, um, adult learners that maybe are going back for other careers. And I get to tell them about careers in healthcare. 
get them excited about, you know, their profession that they could have. Also talking about City of Hope and what it's like to work there. I also get to lead our college student internship program. Now you and I are meeting today, so our timing is not great for that because that process has finished for this summer. However, I'd like to plant the seed in your head about thinking about our paid college internship program for next summer, and I can talk more about that later. It's a great, great program. And then I also get to lead a program. So, you know, we take them from your beginning of your career until your end of your career. So we just had um, a program where retirees got to retire. And I'm sorry, of course, I'm doing a Zoom and there goes the dog to bark, but it, it never fails. I apologize. So um, we had a program where the retirees could retire early. Well, now they can come back in a very part-time way, but still have that connection to City of Hope because they still want to have it. It's, it's in them because it's such a family. It really is of 8,000 people you know, just a little small family. So what I wanted to um, tell you about is City of Hope. I don't know on the call here if anyone has heard of City of Hope. I know that you're in LA. So we are in LA County. To give you demographics, we're about nine miles from Pasadena East. So if that kind of gives you a reference. We're over a hundred acres of the main campus. Now we are a cancer, one of the top cancer institutes in the world. So we have a hospital, a research institute, a graduate school. We manufacture our own medication for our patients. And we also have community clinics, almost 40 of them around the surrounding LA areas. In addition, we're building a sister facility in Orange County, so in Irvine. So as you can see, we're growing. And you know what, during COVID, that didn't change. So a lot of organizations were maybe laying off because they had to and maybe stopped all kind of growth. We continued on. Well, number one, cancer doesn't stop because of COVID. So we still had to take care of our patients and find these treatments and cures. But we didn't lay off one person either during COVID. And that's something just to be said about this organization. I want to give you a little real interesting history about it. So back in 1913, there was another pandemic going on. Some of you probably know it was tuberculosis and it was rampant. People were just dying left and right. So there were these two women that worked in the garment district in downtown LA and they would open up their offices and these people were dying in front of them of tuberculosis. And they said, something has to be done. So they, they were philanthropists. Philanthropists are the people that get donors to give money for good causes, right? So they were able to raise enough money. And back then, if I told you the amount now, you're thinking, how did they buy land? But this was in 1913. And they purchased the land that we're on now. Not as much as we, we've grown it, but we, they purchased some of the land. And they set up the tuberculosis tents, tents for the patients, tents for the staff. And they treated tuberculosis. In the 1940s, another revolution happened, and that was the creation of antibiotics. And so tuberculosis was pretty much eradicated and now cancer was in the front for it. So we became a cancer institute. Now, I know that I had, before I'd even joined City of Hope, I always associated City of Hope and cancer. I would send my friends to City of Hope saying, if you have cancer, go there. They are the best. You will be in the best hands. But what some people don't realize is we also have a huge space in diabetes. And wait till I tell you this fact about diabetes. Some of you on the call might have family or friends or yourselves that have this illness. Some of you know that they have to, people have to take insulin to stay alive, right? Do you realize that synthetic human insulin that pe diabetic patients take worldwide was created by a researcher at City of Hope. By the way, he just retired after 50 years of service. The Diabetes um, Institute is named after him, Dr. Arthur Riggs. You can look him up and look at his amazing career. He's still around, by the way, on our campus. And in a couple of years, we're committed to finding a cure for type 1 diabetes. We're the furthest along in research than anyone in the world. Is that exciting? I mean, this is in pretty much our back door. I don't know where all of you live, but we're in LA County together. 
And these are the exciting things, not to mention all of the things we're doing with cancer and the CAR T cell therapy, et cetera. We have some of the most brilliant minds on campus. But even when I say that, when I said that we're a family of almost 8,000, it rings true. So five years ago when I started, we had about 2,500 employees and we're almost at 8,000. So you see the growth there. We had three of the clinics and we're now at almost 40, huge growth. But even with all of this added growth and people, we still maintain that family feel, that community feel that embraces diversity and embraces our community. It is such a special place to be there. And I hope that if you're, well, I hope you don't have to come for other reasons, but if you're ever, ever in the area and you app and see, we're under construction as well. We are building a hotel for our patient and their families. We're just new, beautiful buildings are coming up. We're keeping the rose gardens that were there from way back when, but you're gonna have this beautiful campus for our very, very sick patients to be, feel a little bit more at peace and know that they're being taken care of and they're in the right hands. So if you're ever in Duarte, drive by, take a look, do a wave. Um, but hopefully some of you will also be part of any collaboration that we do with your school. Tabitha and I are kind of putting our heads together to see what can what we can make work um, for your, you guys are brilliant. And what you guys do, your school, I am just so thrilled that I got to connect again with your organization. So I know I said too much, so I will give it back to the host to um, ask me any questions that you may have. Yeah, of course. So it sounds like you have a lot going on, like you're kind of up and down and doing everything. So how do you uh, make sure that you do everything on time and kind of balance uh, <laughs> the workload? You know, that's kind of timely that you ask that because I was up at 4.30 this morning doing work. Um, I woke up thinking, oh my goodness, did I do that? Now, that's, that's the good thing about being remote because I can just come downstairs in my jammies, right, and, and go ahead to work you have to stay really organized. So in my role, um, you know, we use a lot of tools, um, but I, I, right now you'll see me look, I have two screens. Sometimes I say I need three or four screens. Um, I am still of the old school that I do keep um, running notes for myself, handwritten as well. It works for me. So you're talking to somebody who's been around for, in the work, in HR for about 25 years. I like to make a list and cross it off and feel accomplished as well, but it also keeps me very organized. But I also use Microsoft Office, my calendar. That is, it guides me. It is my memory. It reminds me of things I have to do on, a, on an ongoing basis. You have to do that. You cannot just keep it up here. Even if you're young and you have the sharpest mind, there are things that you'll forget. So there's nothing wrong with writing it down or there's nothing wrong with using the, the tools that are provided to you by your organization. And then you also said now you've fallen into your dream job. So can you describe um, why is it your dream job and like the differences between your old job and this job? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, not that I didn't, I feel like I had my dream job before too. Now I guess this is my dream job point two. I don't know what you would call it, but I love to talk to people. I love being around people. Um, that's why COVID's probably been a little bit of a challenge, but I feel that I've been able to connect even more with my colleagues because sometimes we have these one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings. Um, I have hired over 10,000 people in my career. That's a lot, right? It's a lot of lives that were changed. Now, I'm not saying it was all because of me because it takes a team, but I felt a sense of peace that I was able to match people up with a job that changed their life and changed their family's lives because they still stay in contact with me. Not all 10,000, but people will still reach out and say, you know, Robin, thank you for helping me get this job. This is what I've been able to do. I've been able to put my kids through school, whatever it might be. And that is such satisfaction. And I just, it makes me smile. So those days that I did that, I will always be so fond of and remember that. So now what I'm doing with the community engagement and outreach, I get to get students like you and even adults that are changing their career excited about their future, but also planting those seeds of what else can I, what can I do in healthcare? So I give this presentation that, you know, some people are set out and I know there's a lot of you on this call because you're a medical magnet. 
that are going to be physicians. And kudos to you. We need physicians. There's a shortage of physicians. But some of you might think, oh, I don't know if I want to be a physician, but I still want to be in healthcare. What else can I do? And that's where I get to talk about these are the ideas. Look at this profession, this profession, this profession, where you still can help the patient, even non-clinical. I, my department and myself, we're helping the patient indirectly because I'm bringing the talent in from when I'm speaking to you. I'm, I'm growing those pipelines to be employees one day that are going to take care of our patients or employees that are going to be researchers that are going to research the medication to take care of our patients or they're going to be employees that are IT that are gonna take care of their medical records. Everybody is intertwined in healthcare. You don't necessarily have to be clinical. So I think I get excited because I still get to match people up. I'm planting the seeds. So I'm getting them earlier on in their career than I did before. And I love to meet people that I normally wouldn't meet. So I have partnerships with over 70 organizations and that's just since October. So I am working with so many small organizations, large organizations with diverse groups that never even heard of City of Hope and getting them excited and having them come and work for us. So, you know, it's, I think I did have my dream job and now it, it is my dream job point too. So thanks for that question. Yeah, and it definitely sounds like your um, job is very people oriented. It You're is. talking to a lot of people. Um, how do you keep good relationships with your colleagues and your coworkers? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, you can't just check in when you need something or you need their assistance. You have to check in with somebody on a personal level too. Even if it's a text or a quick email or when you're or a quick Zoom to say, hey, how you doing? Or how are you holding up in with this pandemic? Or, you know, is there anything I can do for you? Or just just being there for them. It doesn't just need to be for a need for you or for the organization. It could be on that personal level and not just, and every now and then, it doesn't have to be that you're hounding them, but you don't want a long period of time to go by and just check in when you need something. It's so important to build those relationships because you need those relationships actually in your work. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing now, I'm doing this new program with the retirees and now I'm seeing uh, my other um, colleagues that I normally didn't have to work with I'm working with them more, but I already had a relationship with them. So they're more than willing to help me out because we had that relationship and it's so important to keep it going. So, you know, it's a, it's a concerted effort. You have to really be intentional about it and say, I'm going to check in with some people today or this week, because you don't want to let that go to the wayside and only call on them when you need something. Does that pressure, uh, you know, needing to check up on everything and check up on everybody else, um, does that pressure kind of, I don't know, how, to, how, to, how do I describe it? You know, it's so funny because it doesn't come as pressure to me. It mm -hmm. just comes natural. Now, some people, it's just, it is natural. It's just in you to, for, for being an HR, you have to really like people, number one. If, if you really want to be a little bit more siloed into yourself, Probably HR is not the, the ideal space for you, um, but so it comes naturally for me. It's, I don't really have to say, oh, I've got to call this person. I just, it, they, they come into my mind and I reach out to them. So it's more of a natural thing. So I don't feel any kind of stress with that. That's just me personally. I don't know if I think I might've lost contact. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, Emily's Wi-Fi went out for a second. Oh, you know, and that happens, right? I mean, we we're all very forgiving during this time because I've now been remote almost a year. I never thought that I would enjoy being remote because I'm a people person. But what I was saying, and, and to piggyback on her question is I feel that I get more time with my colleagues being remote because it's just one-on-one, -on -one, right? On a Zoom, not the interruptions, maybe coming to the office door or a meeting. It's really uninterrupted conversation. So there's been some pluses um, to be remote. Also not having a commute has been really, really nice and been able to have more family time. Even though I they're all in, my family's here in the house. I don't see them during the day, but knowing that we're all here is just something that's very peaceful about that. 
So I was actually in a City of Hope internship program this from, I think it was October to January. It was the YES program, but I don't want to be a doctor. So could you elaborate on how these programs could actually help you, even though you don't want to go into the medical field? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. This is, this is what I, this is what I uh, get so excited about. You know, um, I have counseled many students that were pre-med. Then they would graduate with this pre-med degree and said, you know what? I don't want to be a doctor and I don't know what to do. And that's where I come in. Now, I wish I could come in, could have met them earlier sometimes, but there are many allied health. So when you hear allied health or clinical, a lot of you probably already know that, you know, we're talking the um, still licensed positions, but not physicians. So you've got your nurse practitioner, your physical therapist, your occupational therapist, speech therapist, um, physician assistant, physician assistant and nurse practitioners are in huge need right now. More and more places are using both of those um, careers to have patient loads because they can have their own patients, they can write prescriptions, they can write tests, things like that. So, um, and then there's many, many others, a radiation therapist, respiratory therapist, all of these types of things. So a lot of people that maybe have all those sciences they still want to take coursework for those um, to be in those specialties, but it might not be as long. Now, there are some professions. I love to talk about clinical laboratory scientists, and I bet you some people on this call know what I'm talking about. Those are the professionals that are in our labs. So when blood is drawn or someone's having surgery, where do you think those samples go, right? Somebody has to analyze those and diagnose. And that is a clinical laboratory scientist. They are, sometimes I, people don't really know about them. And then when they hear about this profession, they're thinking, that's for me. It's really a great profession if you love, love science. And you want to help the patient, but you don't want to just be in front of the patient. Um, they are diagnosing in a microscope, using equipment to diagnose a patient. You know, if they get a sample of blood or, or something other, another sample, they work with the pathologist and they come up with a diagnosis. They are an integral part of the medical team. Patients never see them, but certainly our physicians do. Um, do you know that you only need a four-year undergrad degree and then it's a one-year paid internship? All paid internship. And usually those CLSs, then you take, an ex then you take a licensing exam. And then you go right into being a clinical laboratory scientist at a really good salary. They are in such need, you guys, because no, not many people know about it. They just figure, oh, my blood goes and it gets tested or my sample when I had surgery goes, gets, they don't realize who is doing that. And so for someone who really wants to be in medicine but doesn't want to be a physician, that's a great, great career. And you'll always have a job. So I'm sure you've heard that if you have a job in healthcare, whether it's clinical or non-clinical, your healthcare background, do you know you'll always have a job anywhere in the world? Anywhere. Because, well, there's always gonna be sick people. Unfortunately, and fortunately, there will always be sick people and that will need you. So you going into healthcare, you know, I tried with my three kids and out of three, I got one that's in, going into healthcare. Woohoo! So I am very excited. I feel that's a win. But I just, I know that you're in a medical magnet. You hear this all the time, but it's, it just has, a, it doesn't ring. It's the truest it's ringing right now because um, there are more and more opportunities within careers in healthcare than ever. And it's just going to continue to grow. Right. My bad. I'm back. <laughs> okay. But, it happens. Um, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I know you said you're a people person and everything comes to you naturally. Are there any other characteristics you think um, a student needs to have to work in HR? Um, sure, there's some other things. I mean, definitely being organized, definitely being a people person. Um, you, you can't be afraid of hard work. And sometimes there's long hours. You know, I'm going to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? But at the end of the day, it is so rewarding. Um, so let me tell you about the different areas in HR. So I'm from talent acquisition. So it starts with talent acquisition. We are bringing the people in. 
then my partners in HR take over. So then you've got your compensation area. That's deciding on what you're going to get paid, right? So they're the numbers people. So if you like numbers, that's what they do. Then you have your training and development team. So that's really encouraging professional development with employees. And they're coming up with new programs and training sessions for our employees. Then you have your benefits. They're usually called total rewards and they're enhancing benefits for the employees. So we can entice the, the employees. We can keep them happy with wellness and you know, ins great insurance and other programs that they can do. They really came through for us during this COVID offering yoga classes, um, stress relieving classes, you know, exercise, nutrition, different things like that. And then you've got your IT. So you have your own HR IT. So if you like computers and all of that kind of stuff and the data and the research and all that, that's in HR as well. So that's more of a siloed person, I would say. They still have to you know, talk to their colleagues, but they don't really have the one-on-one -on -one with employees usually. Um, there's also a very, very important position. We call them strategic partners and they are the generalists of HR. So they are the, let's say, go between, go between HR and the manager. So when the manager wants to do a reorganization of their department, they work their, with their strategic partner. If they want to look at new job descriptions, they work with their strategic partner. Anything that might be going on that will affect an employee, they work with their strategic partner. So they are a, a really big part of our team. Um, and I think I mentioned all of them. So I think um, there is something for everybody in HR. So even if you say, oh, you know what, I'm really not a people person, there are still, like I mentioned the IT or I mentioned the compensation. Not that you won't talk to people, you just won't have that daily interaction with employees or new hires as much as you would with talent acquisition, talent development, strategic partners. Talent, talent uh, acquisition where I'm at is the one that we get the most face time with employees, right? Or with the new hires or, or the potential new hires. Thank you for that question. And I know you said you just kind of fell into HR. So mm -hmm. can you kind of describe your journey into getting your job? Yeah, well, it's kind of a funny one if you really want to hear it. So um, it's kind of shocking. So this is kind of, use this as a lesson to when you're creating your resume, make sure it's really, you know, telling what you've done and the experience you've had. Do you realize that one word on my resume is where why I am where I am today. It's not a joke. It's crazy. So do you remember when I told you in the beginning that I had that fantastic boss that said, hey, come on in and watch us interview these nurses and see what you think. Well, and then I became, then I kind of got involved in that. So on my resume showed the word nursing. Now I'm not a nurse, but there's algorithms and there's um, platforms within um, hiring systems that pick out words on resumes sometimes. But when I started, it was an actual physical person that was looking at each resume. And that word popped out for it to him on my resume. And he said, oh, I think I wanna meet her. And he called me, this was at UCLA, and called me in for an interview. And it was for nurse recruitment, right? And I started as a nurse recruiter coordinator. I was not a recruiter. And I worked my way up to recruiter, senior recruiter, manager, and now director from that one word. So really take a look at your resumes. Make sure it's a, a really shows what you have done because you never know could that one word be leading you to your career. Now, nothing was handed to me. I worked really, really, really hard. Um, very, very dedicated. Wanted to make sure, and my day never ends, and it still doesn't. I mean, I don't think you you can have your list of things to do, but it doesn't ever say end and you start anew, fresh the next day. There are continued projects that go on and on and on, and it doesn't it doesn't really end. I like being busy, so it's that gets my adrenaline going. 
but literally that's how I fell into it. And I don't do, cha- I don't really change very often. I was at one place almost 18 years and now I've been here for five and, and God willing, I will continue to be here until that retirement time comes for me. So I've been very, very fortunate and blessed, but um, just because the one word got me the job, uh, it doesn't mean that I had to keep the job, right? So I had to work really, really hard um, to keep that job. And um, that's how I am where I am today. If you mind me asking, uh, what was the job you were applying for before um, they gave you that HR job? Oh, uh, just administrative assistant. And they are the ones that said, you know, before they even knew me. And then once they met me, they're thinking nurse recruitment coordinator is perfect. And that's how it kind of worked. And I mean, I was even offered the job right after the interview, which doesn't usually happen anymore nowadays. Um, there is pro- There are processes in place and things like that. Um, and, but they knew I would be a fit. I really wanted it. And I had an amazing career at UCLA Health, got to meet your former students at, at King Drew and got to partner with them. And um, in addition, I wanted to bring this up because one of the really exciting things I get to do, you know, so it's really great when I get to match people up with jobs, highlight. But sometimes we forget about the other abled people. And you you know it in the, in the world is disabled. And I don't like that word. So I'm going to use other abled and some, some disabilities you can't see, um, some you can, but I have worked with an organization called Project Search and they, we work with um, developmentally delayed adults that are on the spectrum, um, the autism spectrum, and it's a work training program. So what they do is they get to train for a year at an organization in all different areas. They're not alone. They have job coaches. And then our staff become kind of their mentors as well. And then at the end of this year, at the year, they know how to write a resume. They know how to write a cover letter. They have to um, apply for jobs and get interviews. And ultimately, we want them to get a job. And I got to start this program at UCLA Health um, with four students, and it's now grown to... I don't know, it's many, many, many that have gotten jobs and have careers now themselves and feel so good about themselves that they are members of society bringing in their own money. They're such incredible employees. Well, I'm happy to say that I get to bring this program to City of Hope in October. And this is the first that it's never been at City of Hope. And so this is another part of my job. This is probably one of the most rewarding and feel good parts of my job that make me smile every day when I get to help people that maybe didn't have direction or didn't think they could work in a healthcare system. And then they are what some of the most trained, well-prepared people after being in a, a year doing all these rotations, they are ready to work. So that's another, I meant to mention that earlier because I it's just such a great part of my job. Thank you for sharing. If you're comfortable, could you give us a general salary of somebody in your position? I can. So now here's the thing. It varies from organization to organization and it varies from industry to industry. So you could, at the director level, you could be anywhere from about 130,000 to maybe 220,000. Now, that's in California. <laughs> we, they pay pretty well in California. Of course, we do have a lot of taxes, right? So we need to make um, a little bit more. But it is, um, it's a pretty decent salary. Now, that's not coming right. I mean, that's many years. That's not just a new person starting out. Um, that's probably a very seasoned person. Thank you for sharing. I was wondering if there's opportunities for somebody in your position to move up in the company and what were those opportunities? Absolutely. That's such a great question because that is on top of mind of everybody. We take surveys at our organization as many organizations do and people really are looking for growth because they love the organization. They want to do their whole career there, but sometimes they might not see 
there's maybe a cap and they don't see that ladder. So we have um, an incredible training and development team that is putting in place with our compensation, these career ladders. So our folks are going to be able to say, okay, I'm an administrative assistant now. In a year, I can go to this and maybe six months I can go to this and they can maybe even stay in their same department. And along the way, we're giving them the tools to succeed. We're not just saying, okay, now you're ready for this one and just throwing them out there. We're giving them the, what they're going to need to succeed. So there is so much growth opportunity. Do you remember when I said in the beginning how we've grown from 2,500 staff to almost 8,000 in five years? So that tells you right there how much growth there is at, at City of Hope in particular, but also in healthcare. That sounds wonderful. Okay, so we have around 15 to 10 minutes left. I just want to open up for the students to be able to answer, ask questions in the chat, anything they're curious. Absolutely. Um, but while they come up with a question and type that down in the chat, um, I was wondering. I, if you, oh, go ahead. No, no, I, go ahead. I was just wondering if you could give us some memorable moments you have uh, working in your job. Oh, wow. I wish I had that um, top of mind. I had some interesting ones. Can I tell you a funny one? I'm going to tell you a funny one. So in one of the buildings I worked at, um, we had a Burger King was down below and then we had the office building. So I was a new recruiter and I went out to get my candidate that I was going to interview. So he comes into my office and I start interview. I'm at my desk and he's against me and I start interviewing him and he literally takes out his Whopper and begins to eat his lunch in the middle of the interview. So at first, you guys, I thought I was being punked by my colleagues because I'm thinking, oh, they planted him. This is a joke on me. So I continued on with the interview. I, I was shocked, but I did everything I could to not show that I was shocked. And then I walked him out and left. And I said, you guys, did you do that? And I go, what? They had no idea. And we, they started laughing. They said, we had no idea. So he literally just wanted to eat his burger and interview with me. So um, that was one of the funniest times for me, um, shocking as well. Um, I think one of the questions that, that came, one of the things I remember asking a, um, a candidate is, you know, why should we choose you? And this person said, I don't have a clue why you should choose me. So these are things that don't do because you're thinking, oh, at least somebody could make something up, you know, but he was very honest that he didn't know why we should choose him. But I've had some really, really great times too. I mean, people that, you know, sometimes I'll meet people and it's that seven degrees of separation. They go, I know I've met you somewhere. And then we kind of go back and figure out how we might have met at one point. Even though we're in one of the largest cities right in the world, 15 million people, it's funny how small it can be sometimes. I did want to, you know, there's a saying and I know you've heard it, but I have lived it I live it every day. I've told my kids about it, but it rings so true. And I hope this for you guys. If you find something, find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And you know what that means? If you, I, I mean, do, do, do I, I love what I do. Do I work, get up every morning and have to work? Yes, I work, but I love what I do. So does it feel like work sometimes? Yes, I'm not gonna lie. But most of the time it doesn't. And I'm, I feel so blessed that I'm living something that I love to do. So I hope that for you, that you find something that you love and it doesn't feel like a job for you. Okay, so we have a few questions in the chat. Okay. Are there, okay. Are there any phlebotomy positions at the City of Hope? There are. Phlebotomy is such a great position, you know, and something that you could do, even if you could do it as a career long-term, or say you're going to school and you want to do it as a supplemental job. Do you know it only takes three months to be a phlebotomist? A certified phlebotomist takes three months. And we um, use them all the time because we have our donor center that we need blood for our, for our patients. But we also have the ones that are in the hospital and in the clinics drawing the blood on our patients. Very needed great, great career. Make sure that you look at um, the American, oh, 
uh, Red Cross is a really good program. Look at the programs and make sure they're accredited before you sign up, but they sh the maximum should be about three months. And then someone LA has a good one too. Someone else asked, do you think you were always good at talking to other people or do you think you had to figure it out during your career? Thank you for asking that because I was just reminiscing about this. Do you know, do you guys, did your parents um, ever start a baby book for you when you were born? I don't know if they do that anymore, but my mom had a baby book. And so you put pictures and you write little things about the baby. So it's, and my mom passed away when I was 18. So I look at this often because it brings back good memories of her. So she wrote in there the date and she goes, at six months old, you are a talker. I can tell that you are going to love people. This is not a joke, you guys. It started at birth for me <laughs> and it's written down in ink. So I can't change that. So that just has always been for me. Um, I remember that I love speaking to people. It doesn't matter if the crowd is a thousand or if it's one person. I remember when I was new at UCLA, I was asked to go speak on campus to some managers about the recruitment process. And I said, sure, I'll go. I didn't realize it was going to be in Royce Hall filled with hundreds and hundreds of deans and associate deans. And I got up there and I was fine. I didn't feel anything different than I was talking to one person. So that's something that just has to be in you. But I always liked people. And obviously, I've always been a talker, says my baby book. <laughs> I think I, like many others, get a lot of anxiety public speaking and speaking to other people, especially mm -hmm. like in that situation that you described. Do you have any advice on um, yeah. the courage? Do you, do you know what they say? There's a saying that says um, people are the, the most feared things from people are death and um, public speaking <laughs> and public speaking more. That's crazy because I have a, my youngest son, he's a senior in high school, I'm going off to college. And he is very introverted and he always says, how do you talk to people? Like, how do you, how are you not nervous? He asked me this all the time. I wish I had an answer for you guys, but I don't, but I can tell you if it, if you're talking about something you're passionate about and you know it really well, it should come really easy. Like you're talking to a friend. I don't have that magic potion to tell you what to do to not be nervous because I don't know it. I just feel that if it's something that you are very comfortable with, think of it as you're talking to your friend. Maybe that's what you should put in your mind that you're not talking to strangers. I mean, right now I can't see all of you on the screen. I only have a certain amount that I can see. Um, you know, maybe think of it as that you're just talking to somebody that you know and having that conversation, not so structured, having it try to flow. But a good thing is practice. Practice in front of a mirror. I tell people that have never interviewed before, they said, I'm so nervous to interview. And I said, do some research on what questions may be asked of you and practice in front of a mirror or practice with a friend because that will make you feel a little bit more comfortable. Are you still going to be nervous? Absolutely. I think everybody still gets nervous in an interview. Everybody still gets nervous when they're going to present. I think the only thing I was nervous about today is when Tabitha said, is this going to be recorded? And I'm like, oh gosh, is my makeup okay? So I think um, you just, I, I don't have that magic. I don't know. I don't even have to say it other than just practice and try to think that you're talking to a friend and make it conversational. That's honestly great advice. Um, so we have another question in the chat. Is there anything you would change about your career? And if so, why? maybe started it earlier. I mean, I've been in it 25 years, but maybe if there was any way to have started even earlier, maybe that would be it. But other than that, it's been a great road, or I should say great ride. And I'm, I, I, I don't, other than if I could have started it earlier. And this is kind of like a more of my curiosity. I know you look at a lot of resumes and like you kind of, the point which ones are good or not. Mm. Is there anything like uh, any advice you have? Yeah. To, to find yeah. A That's a great question. Do you know that there's been studies done that the average time that a recruiter looks at a resume is two minutes because they're looking at so many. So what are they seeing in those two minutes? You want that to stand out on your resume. So you always want to start with your most current job experience, volunteer experience, whatever your most current experience is, 
that needs to be on the top because that's where our eyes go naturally. And you want words that are going to stand out to that organization. Look at mine. Mine said nursing. I was applying to UCLA Health. It was a match, right, for that. So you want, and you don't want to make anything up, so make sure you're using accurate information, but you want those key words to stand out. And please, there's no reason for typos with all of the tools we have. That's really a pet peeve of a recruiter. If there is misspelling or grammar or punctuation, really take the time to make sure that it's perfectly done. There's really no excuse because you could be put in another pile because of the spelling, because that you weren't able to communicate, you know, to write it down accurately. And so you want to make sure that it stands out with your most current information, whether it's a job, a volunteer, whatever it might be, your, whatever that is, and then the company organization and the dates, but really have those keywords pop out. There are some tools online that will help you on what some of the keywords that will mean what you're trying to say. So take some time, look at it, and try to keep it to a one page. Now you're in high school, and I know you probably had a lot of extracurricular, and those are important too, maybe clubs that you've done, volunteer work you've done, events that you've done. Try to keep it to a one page. Sometimes things are gonna go into two page. It's just going to happen. Um, for us that are older, we try to put all the relevant things and not go back 25 years if we don't have to. But for you guys, you should have a one pager. It should be really doable for that. Great, thank you. I'll take that in mind too. You're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> Have you ever seen like a resume and been like, ooh, how did this oh, person like? Oh, abs absolutely. More than I'd like to say. I mean, sometimes the spelling has been atrocious or sometimes they don't even start out with their job and it's just a whole bunch of text. And that's a lot to read too. And then some people try to get really fancy. You know, they're, they're going to get super fancy that you can't really see what they're all about. Now, I see that you want to stand out and that's good to stand out. There's some templates to use. Um, do you, did you guys ever see the movie, you know, um, uh, Legally Blonde and she had pink stationery and she put perfume on it. Of course, we can't, we don't have smell vision here, so we can't smell it. So that always cracked me up when I saw that part. But I think there's some fonts you can use that are pleasing to the eye you don't want to make it dull. You do want to stand out. You do want to have them remember you. Maybe putting your last name in a, in a logo kind of thing, something that stands out to them, but not too much going on. I have seen incredibly atrocious resumes before, and I wanted to help them so bad with it. And for any of the like resumes that you've seen that would like out, like outstand and that are good, is there anything... Mm -hmm. But like, um... Yeah, I mean, I think it's the way they structure it. And I don't have a sample to show you. I've, I've seen some good ones recently, but that it just shows um, kind of what you're seeking for too. Not too long. Um, not, you know, that old thing of the objective, but really tailoring it to the organization that's going to align with our mission that would stand out. Maybe a one-liner, but bolding your um, employer um, and then the rest of the text not being bold, but so we can say, oh, this is where they were. Let me see what they did. So it doesn't blend in too much. If you have the same um, color, you know, like if it's some are bold, some is, if nothing's bolded, then it blends in. So if you have a few things that are bolded, it's really good. Make sure that, can I talk a little bit about your um, email addresses? Make sure they're professional and appropriate. Should I leave it at that? Because I've seen some very interesting ones. No, please go okay. on. This is okay. so valuable. They so need to hear this. I have seen some that tell me way too much about a person and not in a good way. Do you know that that's going to go into another pile sometimes? Because, and that might not even be who you are, but it might be who you are. Just like you've heard whatever's on the internet is going to stay on the internet. Please be careful with your social media. Because when you're out there applying for your colleges or looking for your jobs, we can go on social media. We can see what's been posted. That might not always be in your favor. So I've told my kids, you just make it, keep it really good, you know, and some of my, one of mine doesn't even go on it. So that is up to you. I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to go on social media, but make sure that you're keeping it professional. And when you're making those emails, I know you want to make it fun sometimes and you know, right, maybe some might say fun girl, whatever, or something like that. You know, that could be taken different ways. 
So you want to keep it professional. Maybe it's just your initials and a, um, a few numbers, something like that, because you know, you're competing. There's a, there's a lot of competition out there, you guys, and you are competing and you don't want an email to not help get you that interview, right? You got to get that, that resume with all the data on it is getting you your interview. Then you've got to get the job, but that's your first entryway. And if it's not, you know, up to par, you're not going to get that interview. Then you're not going to get that job. So it takes just a few minutes. I think today, everybody just take a look at your personal email. Is it appropriate? Is my social media appropriate? Because now people are looking at that all the time and saying, is this somebody we want representing our organization? Right. And right now it might look fun to you, you know, 16, 17 years old and all that. And, and I understand that, but think about that stays with you. Anything that's on that internet is going to stay with you forever. <laughs> but the emails, um, that's something I would do right away. I wouldn't even have anything that shows anything that somebody might go another direction in their mind. Is that okay? Is that clear, you guys? I don't want to just wanted to tell you from my point of view, I think it's so important. Yes, that was super clear. Thank you for telling me. Okay, that. you're welcome. Also, I, I didn't think uh, employers would go into social media. Like I, I always heard about it, but I didn't think- Yeah, they do. I mean, I, I have not done that personally, but there are that some people that do um, because it's so easy to do. It's right at their fingertips. And they're like, oh, well, let me see what they're up to. Let me see what they do. And you want good things on social media. If you're volunteering at the um, the shelter, gosh, that's great. Let's see that. Let's see what you're all about. Those are the kind of people that we're looking for, right? Someone that's going and doing something for the community. I know your school is about that. I know what the values your school has. So I know you guys all have those values. So we only have around 10 minutes. So before you know we can dismiss the students um do you have anything that you want the students to take away from your presentation or any like, final word um you know i think that um i wrote some notes to myself so i wouldn't forget but volunteering is a really great way to give back but also expose you to different things that you might not have even known that you might have interest in but it also builds you as a person and it shows what a candidate you would be to me. When I see volunteering on a resume, I can't wait to meet that person and find out what they did with that volunteering because you gave of your time. You didn't get paid. You did that outside of your schooling, outside of your work, outside of your family life. That's important to me. That shows what kind of person you are. There's so many volunteer opportunities you can do within your community and at a hospital too. I didn't even go way back. I started out as a candy striper and you probably don't even know what that is. Maybe, maybe Tabitha knows, I'm not sure, but probably a lot of you don't know what a candy striper is. It's a volunteer in a hospital. That's what I started out at Santa Monica Hospital. And I started out delivering newspapers and I loved it. And I, and I couldn't wait to get promoted to deliver flowers. I was just so excited to go into the patient's room with flowers to brighten their day. And so I remember that and that stuck with me. So volunteering is huge, but also internships. And again, I know that my internship, the process has, has already um, ended, but for next summer, I'll start this process next February, March. Keep a lookout for it because it's a paid program with City of Hope. But any kind of internship you can do, whether it's paid or not, that can help guide you because some of you are thinking, okay, I don't know if I want to be a physician. Maybe I want to see what they do. Or I, I think I might want to be a nurse. What do they do? Or I think I might want to be in marketing and healthcare. What do they do? So if you can get an internship and you can get all these mentors around you, it's ideal to guide you in those directions because you might be surprised. I'm not saying to change your mind, but it might open you, you up to say, oh, that's very interesting to me. Or, oh no, I don't want to do that. Because you want to ask people that come in your path, why did you choose your career? Just like you asked me, what do you love about your career? What do you not like about your career? What do you love about the organization you work in? Why do you stay at that organization? Ask people. And you can just call people up now. I mean, if you are interested in a physician, you can call physician's offices. 
Now with COVID, it's a little more difficult, but you can at least talk to somebody over the phone. And sometimes when things get better and open up, maybe you can even do some shadowing. So I think internships are a great way, volunteering, um, and just being exposed to the different, there's so many careers out there, you guys, that are so rewarding and that you can do anywhere in the world. And I just hope that you get exposed to that. I know your school especially does a great job with that. So you're very fortunate to be able to attend there because some schools don't even have the opportunities that you have. So I know that you, a lot of you are exposed to the visit to a healthcare already. Great. Thank you so much for telling us that. That was honestly you're great so, to hear from you. You're so welcome. And I look forward to working with you guys going in the future. I don't know if I've got juniors on here that I might be working with or seniors. If there are seniors, congratulations on your graduation. I know I have a senior and he hasn't stepped foot on campus this whole year and will not. So my heart goes out to you, but no kudos to you. You guys did it from kindergarten to 12th grade and now beyond. So congratulations to you. And I hope to be talking to you guys in the future. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And I do, I can age myself and say, I do remember Candy Striper. Yay, I'm so glad and I'm not alone, Tabitha. <laughs> <laughs> I would always think of Candy Cane because we would be in pink yeah. and white stripes. <laughs> and I wish I had that now because the it would be a vintage item that might, you know, be be valued, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we so appreciate your time and your insights and your good information. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right.